Welcome to the C.S. Joseph podcast, and this is C.S. Joseph, and let's just get into it because it's probably going to be maybe a longer uh, episode uh, for this uh, particular question. So today's question is, how an INFJ and an INFP succeed at love if both of them are unconscious developed, which is a bit of a complex question. So this is another octogram question uh, relating to uh, both these types. So this is assuming that both of them are UD types, which is you know 50% of their uh, octogram variant. They could both be subconscious focused, or they could both be unconscious focused, or they could be either one of the other. But this question is basically asking, what if they are both UD types, also known as unconscious developed types? Uh, so, and uh, an INFJ who is uh, unconscious developed is closer to their shadow pole of idolization, also known as idolatry. And the INFP uh, unconscious developed also closer to their shadow pole, uh, which is uh, definitely manifestation, where they're literally trying to attempt to bring their dreams into reality. Now, from a cognitive origin perspective, uh, the INFJ, uh, who is unconscious developed, because they're unconscious developed, uh, they are definitely looking uh, for justification uh, more often than uh, intimacy and connectedness. Uh, just from an octogram perspective, while their ego is looking for intimacy and connectedness, their unconscious developed shadow is definitely uh, increasing the demand for justification as their cognitive origin. Uh, just, you know, this is basically where you see an INFJ who is just trying to see what they can get away with, or maybe they're thriving on basically having excuses, especially when it comes to dealing with their own personal failure and seeking out excuses uh, for that failure so they don't end up feeling so useless or worthless all the time. The INFP uh, version of that, when they're being all about uh, manifestation, uh, the cognitive origin that they're typically uh, looking for uh, is they're looking for more validation uh, instead of uh, what they would uh, typically go for, uh, which is power and authority, which is uh, the uh, cognitive origin of their ego. Now, the cognitive origin of uh, validation for the INFP they gain more validation when they uh, are focusing a lot of their effort, if not most of their effort, on manifesting their dreams into reality because, hey, I literally pulled off a miracle here. And because it's such a big uh, accomplishment to manifest a dream into reality, uh, an INFP ends up basically gaining a huge amount of validation, uh, especially external validation from other people. And sure, their ego definitely wants power and authority, but they get the opportunity uh, to go beyond that, uh, which is something that they heavily enjoy as a result, um, which you know is that external validation. So uh, now, because of this thing, uh, you know, INFJs and INFPs, you know, looking for these cognitive origins, um, they end up it ends up adjusting their relationship a bit. Now, don't forget, like. They are in one of the eight uh, sexually compatible relationships here. INFJs and INFPs, it's known as the silver pair, also known as the respect relationship. Now, these two getting into a relationship, it's basically because people have been disrespecting them their whole life, uh, essentially. And there is a lack of respect for their egos, a lack of respect for who they are as people. So these two types are actually drawn to each other because they end up showing each other respect. And because of that, uh, they are able to have uh, a relationship because what was lacking in their life, they're seeking from other people, they're seeking from their lovers, they're seeking uh, from the people that they are most intimate with. And that's what allows these two types to actually come together. It's all about um, you know a higher level of uh, mutual respect. Now, recently, I actually uh, did have an INFJ in my life uh, who, almost had the opportunity to begin a silver pair relationship. 
the problem is is that uh, she did not uh, have that higher level of interest. And the reason why is because there wasn't enough respect, you know, to help actually succeed in uh, maintaining or even holding the silver pair uh, together. While well, the initial attraction was absolutely there, and there was definitely opportunity for going forward, uh, the INFP woman in this particular case just ended up not being interested because from her point of view, although albeit quite shallow in, in my opinion, and also uh, the opinion of a few others in my life, um, is that, uh, you know, misjudging the INFJ in question, uh, misjudging him as a person that uh, she would not be able to draw respect from, much less be able to uh, provide him respect, even though on paper, uh, he's definitely far more advanced and way more capable than she probably ever will be in her entire life, let's be honest. Um, and uh, she just uh, is just so used to like her normalcy bias that as a result of that normalcy bias, she actually is n not able to see through her expert in sensing trickster that this particular INFJ that is in front of her is at a much higher level uh, than she is typically used to. Uh, and as a result, this normalcy bias, she ends up using her introverted feeling hero in a very prideful manner. And this prideful manner basically leads to misjudgment. So she's basically blinded from the fact that she has more than just a diamond in the rough uh, in front of her, uh, where she would actually end up being far more respectable as a result of being in a relationship with him and being respected by him, thus she would be able to respect him as a result. But again, because of that normalcy bias, she was not able to actually come to that conclusion and she missed out on a huge opportunity. And that really sucks, but I guess that's what happens when you're dealing with an expert at sensing trickster who's just not really actually aware of what's in front of them. And it's not unless it actually hits them in the face and they experience it for themselves uh, ahead of time before even the attraction takes place because then there's that familiarity that has you know developed. But this can actually prove challenging, especially when you're looking at from the perspective of an unconscious developed INFJ versus an unconscious developed INFP. Uh, because you remember the INFJ is ultimately going for idolization and uh, the origin that they are looking for uh, is not their primary origin, it's their secondary one, origin of justification. Uh, so when you're, and, and the thing is too, is that like the INFJ oftentimes, like while the INFJ does actually know that idolatry is a big thing, you know, and like, and you know, worshiping things uh, on a consistent basis is not bad, or it, you know, it, it could be a bad thing actually, and that could lead to INFJ corruption. Uh, the origin of justification is important here because the INFJ ends up feeling justified in actually providing that worship. And one of the ways that the INFJ can feel justified in idolizing the INFP in that particular moment is because the INFP would respect the INFJ. They're getting respect out of it. That is what the respect relationship is all about. And also the INFP is honoring the same high level of respect that the INFJ is conferring upon them, provided they don't have their expert in sensing trickster blinders on. But, you know, I mean, hey, normalcy bias is a thing and that really, really sucks, uh, especially for an INFP who's very slothful, because if they're really slothful, that normalcy bias can become a serious, serious problem because they're too lazy to even change or verify or at least be aware of the fact that they might be biased and thus misjudging a golden opportunity in front of them, which sadly is extremely common, especially among FI hero women. It's it's really frustrating. I I I, I, I literally I literally can't even. It just it just it just grinds, grinds my gears uh, as to how that works. But you know, looking at the origin side of the INFP uh, who is unconscious developed who highly values that manifestation pull, uh, the shadow pull of manifestation as we were talking about, the origin that they end up going for is also validation and Validation as an origin uh, for this INFP who is unconscious developed is actually extremely important because the more the INFJ within the relationship is actually able to confer that respect upon the INFP and also the INFP sees that respect as valuable. Because remember, the INFP is still interest-based and needs to know that that INFJ is not just going to be showing that high level of respect to just about 
anyone. The INFP has to be has to feel special or regarded at a higher level than other people in the INFJ's life. And this is especially important. The reason why is, is that INFJs, because they're lust types, uh, typically, uh, they are soul temple templars. Because of that, and they end up rejecting themselves, rejecting their identity, and they need to be able to tack their identity onto something, they have this problem sometimes where they end up treating everybody in their life the same. Actually, Templars in general as a quadra actually have this problem. Templars are NFJs and STPs. Those are all Templar types. Templar types have this issue where they treat people, especially the extroverted Templars. The ENFJs and ESTPs are terrible with this, where they treat people uh, who are closest to them like crap and treat the new people in their life the best, basically. Well, that doesn't mean that INFJs can't do that, and they are at risk of doing this. So if the INFP sees the INFJ treating other people with a higher level of respect than the INFP at any particular moment, it destroys their need for additional validation because the INFP is tacking on their unconscious developed desire for the cognitive origin of validation onto the level and the quality of the respect that the INFJ actually shows them, okay? And this can lead to some really big conflict or some problems. Or, you know, these types could just do the opposite of that. And then the INFJ needs to understand with their FI critic, which it's actually easy for an unconscious developed INFJ to understand that because they understand that their FI critic, that they have to make sure that they are prioritizing the INFP with the level of respect that they show. Okay, that's that's pretty that's pretty standard, right? And the INFP needs to actually utilize their expert thinking to provide reasons why it's okay for the INFJ to idolize them to the level uh, required for the INFJ to show or give that high amount of high quality respect to the INFP over everybody else. And it's just because the INFJ just needs reasons. They just need reasons. And this is one of the reasons why INFJs are so unreasonable because they are not a source of reason. They are a consumer of reason, whereas the INFP is a source of reason, right? Uh, and th that's uh, that. That's ultimately why you know they, they need they need that source of reason uh, to be able to continue. And as long as these things are being exchanged within the context of their sexual relationship, uh, uh, then you know all of the justification required by the INFJ and all of the validation required by the INFP will be fairly exchanged uh, between one another, uh, provided that the the amount and the quality of respect exchanged between both of them because the respect basically becomes the vehicle that contains the buckets that contains the justification that contains the validation that they're actually looking for uh, within the context of their relationship. And this basically allows for the INFJ to feel idolized as well as allows them to show their uh, idolization for themselves, but also idolize the INFP in the process. And then this also gives the INFP the opportunity. It gives them the, uh, man, uh, the, uh, the manifestation, ends up allowing them to develop the motivation required to continue their work to manifest their dreams into reality. And the dreams that they are able to do as they're manifesting, they're actually going out of their way to include the INFJ within those dreams. Uh, and, and as they are manifested. Now, there's a lot of INFPs out there that misuse their manifestation where they, they have dreams uh, in their life, but their dreams only are for themselves. And they spend those dreams on themselves. And when they manifest in the reality, they're not thinking about, for example, their INFJ lover in the process. But if the INFP is truly loyal, not being treacherous and feeding off the respect, the idolization uh, that is in the cart of respect from their INFJ lover, the INFP would make sure that the INFJ is included in every single one of the dreams that they're able to manifest into reality, every single one of the miracles that the INFP is able to perform, basically. And the INFJ is included, if not the centerpiece of those miracles or of those dreams that are manifested into reality, right? So, so basically the INFJ ends up idolizing the dreams of the INFP as the INFP shares those dreams of the INFP and works to help bring them into reality. Whereas the INFP manifests a better future for both the INFJ and the INFP simultaneously instead of just uh, you know manifesting a better future for themselves. And then the INFJ ends up allowing the INFP to have power over this new epic for their lives. You know, as after the miracle's been performed, the INFJ ends up 
than giving uh, the cognitive origin of authority and power uh, via their idolization uh, through to the INFP to actually be able to continue manifesting and keeping this bright future for both of them as a result. And then guess what? The INFP never leaves the INFJ behind as the manifestation continues, as the miracles keep going, and always has the INFJ in mind for every single new level of dream that is manifested into reality. And as a result, it, it creates uh, an engine of success. The thing is, is though, is that like, you gotta be careful because INFJs have this problem where they just feel so worthless or they feel so bad because they all of a sudden, you know, they crave, they're jealous of the INFP's ability to achieve and uh, be able to accomplish and, and manifest dreams into reality. And the INFJ becomes jealous of them over time, which can ultimately uh, lend itself to disrespectful behavior and cause the relationship to break up as a result. However, what the INFJ needs to understand is that that's not their job, that's not their, their, their purpose. Their job is to be a galvanizer. It's their job to empower the INFP in order to accomplish those tasks. And it is the INFP's job to express gratitude and bring the INFJ along with them, along with them for the ride because the INFJ has basically been a power source that the INFP was able to tap in order to manifest their dreams into reality, basically. And this is literally how the inner workings go for this particular silver pair when they, you know, especially if they are unconscious developed, because again, you're dealing with idolization and you're uh, for the INFJ for the shadow pull and you're dealing with manifestation for the INFP with their shadow pull. And they're both, and the INFJ is craving more justification and the INFP is craving more validation instead of their, you know, their, their home origins as their ego origins, as we will say. But as a result, this keeps that engine of respect, which is ultimately the purpose and the reason for the relationship to begin with. You know, if there is a lack of uh, respect in these people's lives, they seek each other out in order to bring respect to each other. But then that can lead to this amazing life, you know, uh, where you know, the INFJ is empowering that which it worships, which is the INFP and uh, the INFP. Uh, is uh, never going to leave the INFJ behind uh, and is always bringing them to new levels and tapping the INFJ as a power source. So the INFJ is consistently feeling useful uh, for the entire duration of the relationship. It's, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, so if you guys want to have like questions like these answered, uh, become an Acolyte member, csjoseph.life forward slash members, become a journeyman member first, then upgrade to Acolyte, or you can, or if you already are a journeyman member, go to csjoseph.life forward slash portal, and then go to the, uh, the Acolyte section there, and then upgrade your account from there. You get to ask me one question a month, which I will turn into a podcast episode, which will be released on our podcast, also on YouTube, so that we all can learn uh, together. So... Uh, just remember, like, you know, the eight sexual compatibilities that each of them are solving a problem. This particular, you know, this one is the respect relationship or the silver pair, and it is solving the problem of a lack of respect. It's, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty, pretty normal. But like I said, you know, octogram really comes in and it definitely impacts, you know, nurture matters, folks. It matters big, big time. And it, and it really impacts uh, this silver pair in this direction. When you both have two unconscious developed types in a relationship, you still have to you still have to be cognizant of what the point of this sexual compatibility is. And the point of the silver pair is respect. And if that's the case, how can we use respect as a way to transmit or to communicate or give uh, the cognitive origins that the other person is looking for, right? That's always the question that needs to be top of mind for any of these people uh, who are participating in this particular relationship. And there are similar questions or similar ways of doing things or similar methodologies that need to be top of mind for the other eight sexual compatibilities as well. It's, 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 major, it's majorly important. And because of the octogram, we have so many different perspectives and so many different uh, ways of doing things and so many different things that need to be kept uh, track of in order to maintain these relationships, which can be easily done if you have that fundamental understanding of the octogram and as much as having the fundamental understanding of the type grid as well and all the associated vectors. So anyway, folks, there's plenty more content like this to come and I'm very happy uh, to have the opportunity to uh, share with you. So thanks for watching and listening and I'll see you guys on the next episode.